the, the name of the, today's event is Blockchain Basics for Nonprofits Preparing for the Future. We hear these terms every day like blockchain, cryptocurrencies, NFTs, but what do they really mean? Uh, and more importantly, uh, how can they open up new uh, opportunities for leaders in uh, nonprofits and those of us working in civil society? In this first, uh, in a series of uh, community events focused on nonprofit leaders, Jason Shim will take you through the fundamentals of blockchain and explain how they can be used by nonprofits. This event is supported by an award from the Filecoin Foundation for the Decentralized Web. My name is Billy Bickett, and I will be your host today. Who are we? We are TechSoup, a global network that's bridging uh, technology solutions and services for good. We're a 501c3 nonprofit that started in San Francisco in 1987 and uh, now have offices in London, England, and Warsaw, Poland. Uh, we're a capacity building nonprofit uh, with a a mission to bring new emerging technologies to the sector in a responsible way so that folks can get the information early and find the support they need to integrate new tools into their mission-driven activities. Uh, this learning series is all about creating the conditions for builders of public good technology and what we call civil society integrators. It's about creating a new interface for those builders and those integrators to be together and better understand each other's world and really to harness the new technologies that are emerging early, effectively, and responsibly. In terms of our community, we are an inclusive global community that puts community first. We're here to support each other. Our intent and interest is in building stronger nonprofits and a more resilient civil society. And we invite your active participation in the chat and after the talk today, you'll have a chance to run through questions and answers as well. So with that, let me introduce our guest experts. Today, we have Jason Shim, co-author Bitcoin and the future of fundraising. How can we harness technology to make a difference in the world? That's the question Jason loves to explore with organizations. With experiences spanning the nonprofit and academic sectors, both as an employee and a consultant, Jason stays ahead of the technology curve. In 2013, he led Pathways to Education Canada to become the first charity to issue tax receipts for Bitcoin donations. He's been at this for a while. That's about a decade in the Bitcoin and blockchain game. He serves as an editor at Ledger, a peer-reviewed scholarly journal at the University of Pitt Pittsburgh that publishes full-length original research articles on the subjects of cryptocurrency and blockchain technology. Where Really grateful to have Jason here. Also, we're joined by Ann Connolly, our Web3 subject matter expert. Ann's been instrumental in helping us put this program together. And Ann will be here to support uh, questions and answers uh, in the chat and also at the end of uh, Jason's talk. So with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and pass the mic to Jason to kick us off. Hey, thanks so much, Billy. Uh, I'll... I uh, jump into uh, the presentation. Uh, so first, hi, uh, my name is Jason and I've spent my career in the nonprofit sector. And uh, as Billy mentioned, I'm co-author of uh, Bitcoin and the Future of Fundraising along with Anne Connolly, uh, who's also uh, on this uh, webinar. And in, in the, over the, the last, uh, you know, so uh, 10 years, uh, I uh, helped to deploy one of the first uh, implementations of issuing tax receipts for cryptocurrency donations. And since then I've helped many others in setting up their own programs and um, have had the opportunity, uh, like these to share, uh, knowledge, um, more widely, uh, based on my experience. So in terms of what you can expect for today is that I'm going to be sharing a nonprofit perspective on working in the blockchain and uh, areas as well. All right. So new technology brings new philanthropy and with each successive wave of technology that comes out, philanthropy finds a way to find a space uh, in it. So first, I'll take the example of a television, monumental communications medium that radically changed many things uh, about the world. And from a phil philanthropic view, one of the, the things that intersected with philanthropy were things like telephones. And so you have this communications medium that's reaching out into living rooms around the world. And so the development of a mechanism for people to solicit donations, to engage with new audiences emerged in the form of telephones. Similarly, with the internet, here that you can uh, also 
have a way to connect and communicate with people throughout the world. And what that looked like from a philanthropy lens that was laid on, on top of it was also donations. So here's the example of the TechSoup donation page. And what that enabled was that uh, it brought about online giving and crowdfunding. And these are two just very, very short examples, but here's a whole bunch of different examples along the way where the evolution of philanthropy as in relation to technology from moving from writing checks to moving to online credit card donations to using very diff various different communications mediums and technology. And finally, the, the last one, uh, example that we have here is blockchain technology. And so that's what we're here to talk about today in terms of understanding how can some like blockchain also intersect on that front with regards to uh, philanthropy and to nonprofits. So first of all, what are blockchains? Now think about blockchains as a notebook or a, a ledger. And imagine if everyone had a, a ledger and everyone on this call had an, a notebook or a ledger and say, I gave a hundred dollars to Billy and everyone is simultaneously keeping a record of this. Everyone has a magical ledger that is also updating itself to indicate Jason has given Billy $100. And the thing about this ledger is that everyone has a copy of it here. It's replicated and it's replicated some more. Say everyone on this call gets their automatically magically updated ledger that indicates that yes, Jason gave Billy a hundred dollars and or Billy made a transaction as well. And he decided to give Eli dollars. And this is all recorded uh, on the ledger shortly. And this is all just part of the system itself and the way it's built on the, for the blockchain by using things called consensus mechanisms. And with each additional piece of data that is added, it's added to this chain of information or a block. And so if any changes are made or say, if I tried to claim, oh, wait a minute, I didn't actually give Billy a hundred dollars. I'm going to try to change it to 50. The way that the blockchain works is that it becomes immediately evident and it's very easy to tell if any changes have been made to it. And so it would stick out like a sore thumb. So the, the bottom left there is a visual representation of that, of how the, the blockchain would function in that regard is that it would be very clear or evident that a change had been made to the, the blockchain. And so one of the, the benefits uh, about uh, blockchain technology is that once data is entered onto a blockchain is that it is mutable or in other words, it cannot be changed. And so why is this important? So immutability can be uh, important because it ensures data integrity as well as security and transparency. These are all elements that are also uh, quite important to those working in the nonprofit uh, space, as well as uh, civil society organizations. Now, typically. <clears throat> This is important because entire organizations and structures around verification can exist to address the issue of data integrity, security, and transparency, acting as intermediaries and all, all these organizations, they're, they're still very important. However, blockchain represents a mechanism for which some of this can be embedded into the technology or infrastructure itself. And in some cases, potentially automated. So when we think about some potential use cases that blockchain technology may be useful for. Some of the things that immediately come to mind are things like payments, which I'll speak about in more detail in the next section about cryptocurrencies. The example that I gave around recording on a blockchain that I transferred hundred dollars over to, to Billy and multiply that by hundreds, thousands, millions of transactions, all recorded onto an immutable blockchain that can be really helpful for keeping track of transactions. Other use cases that blockchain may apply to are things like supply chain as goods are you know, moving through a supply chain and you're, you're looking to verify, uh, that it is authentic or that you have provenance for where things have uh, come from, where they have gone, that can be employed to help support supply chain use cases as well. Things like digital identity systems, many of current models depend on storing digital identity information with uh, central servers in order to verify individuals. However, taking a decentralized kind of blockchain approach may allow the information to be encrypted onto within the blockchain and then folks would authenticate against it and that it would be a way to securely 
uh, authenticate against a database without necessarily having to store all of it in, in a centralized environment. Jason, we have a, a few questions that have come through that I think are relevant to this this part. Oh, yes. Richard, okay, I see the Richard I've seen your questions and we'll have those come up a little bit later in the presentation. But um, Samir is wondering what kind of data can be put in a blockchain, images, video, that kind of thing. Yeah. So generally speaking, uh, technically, you, you, know, you could embed uh, you know, many sorts of data in a, in a blockchain. However, um, you know, one thing to keep in mind is that within a blockchain uh, is that the, the economics of it is that you typically have to pay uh, to store the information on there. So it, it depends on the specific blockchain and it depends on the mechanism that is being used. But yes, there, there are many different types of files or data that you can store on a blockchain. And for instance, something like Filecoin is actually designed specifically for things like data storage and incentivizing folks to, to do that accordingly. Yes, all, all, all sorts of data can be stored in a blockchain. And I'll qualify that with saying that it, it also depends on the specific blockchain that you are utilizing. Generally speaking, you probably wouldn't want to store uh, a, a very large file on a payments blockchain because it would be quite expensive that you may want to use one that is more particular to data storage uh, or something like that. Great. And then a couple more questions here. How is it access stored? How, oh, sorry. How is it accessed and stored? Are there several blockchain warehouses slash owners? Yeah. Blockchains function in terms of there may be different, different types of projects for which people are hosting. It, it works in a decentralized kind of way. So there are various nodes that may be hosting the, the blockchain itself and that synchronizes among itself. So it really depends on where uh, who is participating and where it may be uh, hosted. So the question to where it's, it's hosted, it's uh, wherever the nodes uh, may uh, uh, potentially be. So it could, they could be scattered all throughout the world, um, throughout North America, depending on uh, the type of project um, that is uh, being undertaken. Uh, in terms of where it's stored, uh, the data is stored uh, within the nodes um, of the blockchain. So when I say nodes, it, it's referring to if someone is hosting a server in a certain space, then that would be one node as part of a wider blockchain. And there are many different blockchains that that exist out there. Great. One more question here. We've got, how do I show that I have 100 US dollars in a blockchain? Yeah, I'll, I'll get to that a little bit later in, in terms of that example of if you're referring to something like a cryptocurrency or such that you could be using something like a, a stable coin to represent US dollars and that it would be recorded on the ledger of of that, that you, that you would have transferred hundred dollars over to another user. And that it's recorded within the, the data uh, of that uh, particular cryptocurrency or, or blockchain. And I'll, I'll talk more about the relationship between cryptocurrencies and, and blockchain uh, later in the presentation uh, as well. Great. We have a few more questions, but I think, why don't we continue? And some of them will be a little more relevant to later parts of the presentation. Yeah. We'll bring them up then. So the next question is how, what are cryptocurrencies and how do they work? In terms of the relationship of blockchain to cryptocurrency, blockchain is a technology that enables cryptocurrency. As I explained earlier, the, the concept of blockchain is a, a series of uh, ledgers or, or kind of notebooks uh, that are updating themselves and built in such a way that when one change is made to one section or to one element that it, it, it's reflected across all of them and it's added to the chain of uh, data for transactions. And it's important to understand the history as well to get some context around cryptocurrency and blockchain. And so the best known one, here's the logo for Bitcoin. And the origins of Bitcoin were from Bitcoin white paper, which was published on October 31st, 2008. So yesterday was actually the, the 15 year anniversary of the publication of the Bitcoin white paper. And so what this did was that it outlined how a peer to peer electronic cash system would would be used and it described in detail how um would be employed uh, using it and i it's a fairly readable paper in that it is written in, in somewhat academic uh, language uh, however it, it is readable in, in terms of going through it and under, if you're interested in, in the inner kind of workings and mechanics of uh, how bitcoin works but fundamentally is that um from a uh, a digital currency standpoint is that uh it presented a view for how a, a digital electronic cash mechanism could work and that it isn't owned by any particular government or corporation and it could be sent anywhere in the world so long as folks had access to an internet connection and it could be used to store value and make transactions. 
And so if you think about using a cryptocurrency on a blockchain and what the alternatives could otherwise be is that if you had to send funds all the way across the world to someone else, is that a cryptocurrency like Bitcoin or, or others could be sent anywhere in the world in a matter of seconds. And when looking at parts of the world that may not necessarily have a robust banking infrastructure, that can become very important. So let's, say, let's say if there's access to the internet, but there isn't a robust financial system, that these are the kinds of examples for which something like a cryptocurrency may prove to be uh, valuable. And you can think about it in a sense of something like digital gold, in that it's the concept of being able to store value digitally was quite a different one after the publication of, of the Bitcoin white paper. Because up, up until then, when you think about how do organizations or individuals represent value digitally, it all relies up until that point really on a centralized model that say if I want to transfer, going back to the example of transferring $100, is that you, know, you would have, prior to that, you would be working through an intermediary and uh, saying, I'm transferring you this $100 through this uh, online financial institution uh, or something. And that it would re rely on the intermediary to uh, record that and prove it and that any changes could be made to it as well. Chances are it, it probably wouldn't be, but you would still need the intermediary to make that happen. However, a cryptocurrency uh, like Bitcoin, what that represented was a way to transfer value without necessarily having a centralized intermediary and then that's value having it uh, decentralized. The, the other thing that I, I want to touch upon briefly was Ethereum in terms of understanding the, the different things like uh, decentralized applications and smart contracts. While Bitcoin was focused primarily on being a store of value, uh, Ethereum uh, came out a, a few years later and it allowed for things, it was essentially a programmable Bitcoin. So in addition to being a cryptocurrency in itself, is that you could actually execute code on, on the Ethereum network. And so what that uh, enabled was that you could develop decentralized applications and that they would operate on a decentralized network rather than a central server and distributed apps could use you know, blockchain technology to provide transparency, security, and imm immutability of data, and they could incorporate smart contracts. Uh, which would be a, a self-executing code that could automate and enforce certain aspects of an application's functionality. One of the, the nicknames that was given uh, for Ethereum was also a world computer. So that, that's an example of another kind of cryptocurrency with additional functionality uh, on it as well. And when there are other functions that could be attached to Ethereum, such as NFTs, which are, are non-fungible tokens, which I will speak to a bit later as well. Jason, we got lots of good questions here. One of them is from Gil, and I answered it in the Q&A, but I think it's important to bring up live. And that's yeah. the question of if, they're, if, if blockchains are so secure, how do people manage to steal so much money from them? So the, generally speaking, the, the cryptocurrency, for, for a lot of blockchains that are developed, they, they have quite robust cryptographic mechanisms. And typically when folks hear about thefts of cryptocurrency from exchanges or others is it's usually due to a lapse in other areas of security. One example is say if someone stored their wallet seed, so that's the, the keys to your wallet inside say a password manager and say the, if the password that was used for that password manager was involved in a credential stuffing attack, which is someone found a, a database of usernames and password and the same password was recycled across maybe multiple places, then that those kinds of instances uh, may uh, prevent an opportunity for a dedicated uh, and motivated attacker uh, to get access uh, to that information and subsequently access to a wallet. Uh, the others are uh, that the exchange itself uh, may be hacked, uh, but in terms of the blockchain itself um, getting hacked, uh, that it's typically uh, not due to uh, those kinds of um, instances. It's uh, usually um, folks getting access to credentials or administrative uh, accounts or like an unsecured computer itself. But if the cryptocurrency is properly stored, which I'll speak to in about the cold wallets and such, then it, it's, it is secured that way. But when folks do hear about exchange hacks and such, it may be due to security lapses on the part of the exchange rather than the blockchain itself or things like smart contracts which may have code that may not have accounted for uh, certain 
use cases that they left it open and someone was able to run malicious code against a smart contract. Yeah, that's great. I always think about it like if a, a website gets hacked, it doesn't mean the internet was hacked. And so yes. it's the it's, if an exchange gets hacked, it doesn't mean blockchain was hacked. It just means one one service that was connected to the blockchain um, mm -hmm. got hacked. So yeah, let's keep going. Got yeah. a few more questions, but I'll bring them up as we go along. Yeah. So in terms of practical use cases for cryptocurrency, some of the immediate ones that come to mind is that the remittance market is huge, over $50 billion industry and growing. The be able to send stores of value across, across countries, across oceans, and I know, and when in the past, you have shared examples when working in developing countries that if there isn't robust banking infrastructure, that folks may have to carry backpacks full of cash uh, to make payments. And that is a scenario that for some who are working in that specific kind of scenario in the nonprofit sector is that's reality where, you know, if you, you can't just send an e-transfer of payments, you may have to carry a lot of physical cash. And, but if there's internet access, something like cryptocurrency or blockchain technology can help alleviate that helping to bank the unbanked. So having access to financial systems and as well. And finally, as I shared earlier, having something like a world computer or computing platform, which enables programs to be running constantly in the backgrounds. And this is very emergent still, like we're still in the early stages of folks deploying things like decentralized data applications and it's further growing. And really uh, it's also what folks can think of in terms of what use cases may fit their particular um, organizations or instances. And I'll speak to some examples of how folks have connected interesting things over to the Ethereum blockchain in particular, but can readily apply to others as well. I can talk a little bit about buying and selling cryptocurrency. So sometimes a question emerges something, how do you buy and sell a cryptocurrency? The short answer is that at the present time, uh, for most organizations, individuals, the, the, the shortest path is going to be uh, buying through an exchange. Uh, it's much more robust uh, than, you know, where it has been in the past. Uh, you would sign up for an exchange and you know, do the uh, authentications and then send them uh, money and then you're, you're good to go. I will share that the, uh, the evolution of it is that in, in some of the early days, some of you may have heard the story before where someone paid 10,000 uh, 10, Bitcoins for two Papa John's pizzas. Um, and so they're, of course, you, know, you, you can do the, the barter kind of mechanism, but we're not, uh, we're well past that at this point. Uh, there are also stories of folks trading them for World of Warcraft items or, or things like that. Um, while you theoretically can do that, there's a much more robust system and network of exchanges that's emerged with also additional government regulation that has emerged as well uh, over recent years that also govern how these exchanges function in accordance with existing financial services and the broader banking sector as well. So the short answer is the most straightforward way for most individuals and organizations to just sign up. And from there, giving everyone a heads up that when you do, many governments also uh, have AML or KYC requirements, which is anti-money laundering or know your customer regulations. You, know, you will likely be asked to provide a form of ID as well as filling out some forms uh, if you're applying as an individual, as well as additional proof with regards to verifying things like address and identity. You may need to send a picture of an ID card or something like that. For organizations, it will depend on the exchange, but it is not uncommon to have to submit things like articles of incorporation to prove that you are a legitimate entity and as well as information about your executive leadership and or your board um, information about them, as well as signatures and sign-offs. So this is part of the, the mechanisms that many of these exchanges that have connections to existing financial systems uh, will require in order for you to sign up uh, for an account. Okay, so there's the question that is asking, is there a website available with a list of all vetted exchanges? Website available with a list of all vetted exchanges. It depends on where you are tuning in from. I know that depending on where you are, check with something like your local securities commission that they cryptocurrency, some exchanges may need to register with their local securities commissions in order to have a license to exchange or trade cryptocurrency. So if you're looking for a vetted exchange insofar as they are working with the appropriate government authorities, it's, that would be the place to check out of checking with the securities commission around who, who has a license been granted to for exchanging or buying or selling cryptocurrency in that regard. So moving on to storing cryptocurrencies. So there, there are various ways to store cryptocurrency, uh, depending on your personal comfort level and trust. Um, 
You can leave your cryptocurrency directly on an exchange. However, the risk is that if anything happens to that exchange, you may be at risk of losing your cryptocurrency. However, it's known as a custodial wallet. But there is a phrase that's uh, sometimes used in the one uh, cryptocurrency enthusiasts, not your keys, not your coins, in that you're, it, it'll depend to the degree that you trust the, uh, the exchange that holds your, your cryptocurrency. I'll go through the other mechanisms of storing as well. Beyond crypto exchanges, there's various types of wallets. So the, the little illustration of the, or the logo of the, the Fox there is a uh, MetaMask, uh, which is one type of wallet. It's a, a software type of wallet that you could add it as a uh, browser extension. And it's what's known as a hot wallet. And hot wallets are ones that are connected to the internet and they may sit on a computer or a piece of software. And it's useful if you are on a website and you're looking to store or exchange cryptocurrency or interact with a decentralized app. However, if you're looking to store longer term, it's generally advised to use something like a cold wallet. And so what a cold wallet is, it's actually a physical device that sits separate from your computer that you would plug in to authenticate transactions or to store over longer term. And so uh, what's illustrated here in the middle is uh, a ledger wallet, uh, as well as a Trezor, uh, which are a couple of examples of uh, cold uh, wallet uh, physical devices that uh, folks can use for extra security uh, when storing uh, cryptocurrency. It's worth noting as well that when a wallet's created, a series of 24 words can also will, will be issued. Uh, and that series of 24 words would allow you to recreate your, your wallet should anything happen. And that also needs to be stored very securely as well for organizations. If you were to store it directly on your computer, again, generally not advised to do that that because it does pose a risk that if anyone were to get access to the 24 words and they would have access to your crypto wallet. And finally, sending cryptocurrency. How do you send cryptocurrency? Each wallet uh, has a, uh, a corresponding uh, wallet address. So this is the, the wallet address for the, the ledger journal. Uh, and so it's as simple as pulling up uh, a phone or copying and pasting uh, your wallet address, and then you would send the um, cryptocurrency uh, to that address, and then it would be reflected uh, on the, the blockchain uh, after it has been received and confirmed. I see that the question went in on from John, when a nonprofit receives a donation of cryptocurrency, it is necessary to have their own wallet address, other best practices in this area. It, it really depends for when receiving a donation of cryptocurrency, if you're working with an exchange or a service like the giving block, they will issue an address that generally will be like a one-time use address that will be specifically used to receive it. And then organizations like the giving block or, or others would take care of it and notify you and, and uh, issue the receipt and let you know. Uh, however, it is possible for nonprofits to also receive crypto directly in their own private wallet. However, it's what's um, helpful to keep in mind is that does present additional overhead uh, for an overhead in the sense of time and complexity for an organization. It, it is possible for a nonprofit to receive directly in their own private wallet. However, you also have to make sure that you, the wallet is properly secured, stowed, that you have internal procedures in place for who, who accesses the wallet and how it will be transferred to an exchange if you're looking to liquidate afterwards as well. So in terms of setting the stage, it's, it's worth keeping in mind some of the why may organizations want to consider adopting a, a cryptocurrency program. So one thing to keep in mind is this was all way back from 2013 is that uh, around the, the, this time and, and others that Canadian Mint was looking to test its own digital money project. And since then, there have been additional explorations by various governments around things like central bank digital currency. So the uh, digital currency is something that organizations are, or go governments are actively you know, exploring as well. The other is that this was in 2014, that uh, donations started coming in for various causes. Th this one made Headlines at the time were, in this instance, the Jamaican bombsite team getting $30,000 worth of uh, Dogecoin for the Sochi Olympics. And so you had people that were starting to search charities using the search terms, charities accept Bitcoin or charities accept cryptocurrency. And I know this because I reached out to a donor in, who had made an early donation and asked them directly, hey, so why didn't you give to, to our particular organization? And the response was, you were the only organization that I could find that accepted uh, Bitcoin. And so I, I, I gave it to you. And uh, the, the landscape is very different now. There, there's many more charities that accept cryptocurrency. Um, however, the ones that do it 
And there was an earlier uh, study uh, that uh, was conducted a few years ago that indicated that something like 4% of charities accepted Bitcoin. And I believe that number is higher now, but there was also a, a stat recently that uh, among the Forbes top 100 charities that it's closer to, I think something like nearly 50% of those organizations are now in position to accept cryptocurrency. So trend-wise, more organizations have increased their capabilities to accept cryptocurrency alongside other ways of receiving donations to the organization, such as stock donations, et cetera, that cryptocurrency is part of the mix as well. And so it's worth noting that in December 2017, that $55 million was offered to charities via the Pineapple Fund. And so what this was, this was an anonymous donor. And to this day, it's not known who this individual was and that 60 organizations were selected to be uh, recipients of varying amounts. And the, these donations ranged anywhere from a few hundred thousand dollars to millions of dollars. And many of the organizations had to quickly scramble to, to quickly figure out how to accept cryptocurrency, though it was also an opportunity to engage volunteers and mobilize for, for making this happen. Uh, but what this enabled was someone who had accumulated a significant amount of wealth through cryptocurrency was able to donate it quite quickly to various charities. And thank you, Susan, for sharing in, in the chat that you can find charities who accept crypto donations through every.org as well. Another example is Mary Merkel. So this is a really interesting example for Covenant House uh, uh, in Toronto, which is an agency, Canada's largest agency serving youth who are homeless, trafficked, or at risk. And a group of Ethereum developers have gotten together to create an in-person fundraiser and raised over 134 uh, ETH. And I think at the time it was about 70 or $80,000. And I think in present day, yeah, you see that. It eventually it went up to higher to about 150,000. But the interesting implementation that they had was that they actually created a Christmas tree with lights that was connected to the Ethereum network. And it would actually activate the lights based on the donations that were being made in real time. So it was a really interesting intersection of something like a blockchain technology and cryptocurrency also connected to real world connectivity in, in that regard. So the additional benefits that came out of that for those who were able to get on these the cryptocurrency implementation were uh, marketing and PR uh, through earned media, being able to position the organization as being quite innovative, uh, invitations to inform future developments uh, around some of those projects, uh, additional donations, collaborations, and quite frankly, future proofing the organization. Going to the motions of trying to figure out how you would accept cryptocurrency and also work with a blockchain help provide the opportunity for an organization and its staff to learn about the technology as well as figure out the internal systems that were, would be needed in order to deal with it. And in terms of shell use cases, uh, so I, I mentioned earlier things like remittances, working in to bank those who are uh, unbanked. Other use cases and implementations are also things like education incentives. SmileyCoin is an interesting project based out of the University of Iceland. And what this was in education incentives for students to answer questions. The Tutor Web System is an open uh, education system uh, and that uh, when uh, students would be uh, going through uh, questions or being quizzed or being in, in kind of a drill environment is that they would receive smiley coins for uh, going through uh, the, uh, the, the, the drilling kind of process and answer a question and then get a smiley coin uh, and then the, the incentives of the smiley coin could be redeemed for vouchers for discounts on uh, coffees uh, or things like that from uh, the, the, and one interesting uh, part that the smiley coin project had was that they also provided an opportunity to actually donate the value of the smiley coin to projects. So this is an opportunity for students to not only earn smiley coins through taking part in incentivized kind of education uh, elements relating to their coursework, but also getting engaged in broader philanthropy through the opportunity to donate their smiley coin to causes. Smart contract trusts. So this is a really interesting one that came out of uh, Charity Water in that uh, one of the things around uh, some folks who may be engaged in cryptocurrency <clears throat> is hodling or holding cryptocurrency and not selling it. And so that, that's like a, a joke among some in the community. And I think Charity Water recognized this and said, hey, we're going to have a smart contract that if folks deposit in here is that we uh, confirm that we will not sell it until at least 2025 so that it can accumulate value to support water projects for clean water. And at present time, the value of it is about three and a half million US dollars. And this amount will continue to be held until 2025 before 
the first opportunity for liquidation there. Uh, the other is around NFTs. So NFTs can take various forms on various blockchains. And here's an example of you know, Matthew of the Calgary Flames. He had issued an NFT and was able to raise $28,000 for which went to the St. Louis Children's Hospital and the Alberta's Children's uh, Hospital Foundation as well. So this was an auctioned uh, NFT. And what an NFT is, it's a, uh, a, a tokenized uh, representation, um, uh, typically of a piece of artwork, uh, though it could be any sort of uh, data, it could be a video or such. Uh, and so uh, this piece of uh, art, uh, a digital sports memorabilia was released uh, as part of a, a fundraising initiative. And another is the Immortal Poppy, uh, which was uh, created by the Royal Canadian Legion. And so what this was that it was, it's actually digital poppies for Remembrance Day uh, in Canada, which is November 11th. And so the were sold for 0.1111 Ethereum at approximately a value of about $500 Canadian for each poppy. And what I spoke about earlier in terms of embedding additional kind of programming into blockchains is that Subsequently, if the NFTs are sold in the future, is that what's embedded within that contract is that a 10% royalty from every resale will go back to support the Royal Canadian Legion as well. And so this fundraiser engaged a wider cryptocurrency uh, uh, audience and uh, generated over $40,000 uh, in sales and, and resale uh, royalties. The other thing to, to uh, putting on, on folks' uh, radar is a pull-ups. So pull-ups could be interesting for stewardship opportunities for organizations is in that what a pull-up is, it's a proof of attendance protocol. And say if you met someone at a conference or if you attended an event that you could be issued a pull-up, which you would store in your wallet. And what, make this, what makes this interesting is that you now have a representation of that as saying, hey, I spoke to this person or hey, I attended this event, is that something like pull-up could be a really interesting a use case for stewardship opportunities for being able to verify prior donors or event attendees instantly and providing opportunities that are specific to folks who may hold that particular token that is connected uh, to your organization. Similar to that is that things like carbon credits, discarbon um, is something that is connected to POAP as well in that yeah, it can actually provide you an estimate of carbon emissions due to plane travel and you can buy on-chain carbon credits and then retire them on the Polygon network and offset the estimated emissions and folks can be issued a POAP as well related to this. And in terms of emerging use cases of blockchain and, and within the decentralized web is that currently in the real fiscal world, there, there are things like insurance contracts, rainfall insurance, where if under a certain amount of rain falls in a certain area and if you have an insurance contract with an organization around that, you would settle that in terms of indicating, okay, there, there wasn't enough rain and so we have this contract. And so some of those things could potentially be handled on uh, a blockchain itself, where using things called oracles, which are mechanisms to confirm data and you can attach smart contracts. An example of that is that the Associated Press actually had oracles developed where they would actually issue uh, on the Ethereum network that to confirm the, the outcome of during the American elections. And when as the results were, were coming in for the various states and such that the information would be posted to the Ethereum network. And then from there, folks could actually potentially configure smart contracts to trigger certain things to happen depending on what the, the data was indicating. And things like this, when you think about what may be possible, if you could make that programmatic and actually integrate that into broader applications, it could be really interesting. And finally, things like tax receipts. Currently, a lot of organizations, when they do issue a receipt for a donation, that they're issuing it from their own kind of internal systems and such, and that you may have to pull it out at some point to let's say if you're filing your taxes, then you may need to prove it is that uh, a use case for a blockchain certainly could be around the tax receipting. That may be something on the, on the horizon potentially for exploration. Jason, while we're on the tax receipting, mm -hmm. and we only have a couple minutes left, so we'll have to yeah. keep answers quick at this point. Um, yeah. Where would you suggest finding accounting services that can manage cryptocurrency donations? And what are the tax implications? Yeah, so that, that may be a question that maybe I can go into further detail during the Q&A next week. But the short answer is it's really reaching out to firms currently and asking them if they have expertise in, in that particular area. 
The other is if you search some of the existing software that is out there for around managing uh, taxes, that some of them do have uh, listings of uh, corresponding accountants as well that uh, may be able to uh, assist as well. So in terms of uh, setting up your program, the making sure you secure, secure buy-in from your organization, getting executive support, getting all these folks around the table, the finance, fundraising, so that you can get integration with existing systems, receiving legal and marketing, and make sure that's covered. And when thinking about securing organizational support, making sure you hone in on some of the key drivers that typically motivate folks to get involved in these types of projects. So things like revenue, new donors, innovation, uh, et cetera. And when thinking about your organization, where does your organization typically fall with regard to adoption of technology? If you uh, tend to be early adopters, uh, then you may be very well positioned for undertaking a program. If you're a little further uh, along the adoption side uh, for innovations, then that's worth keeping in mind as you're assessing promoting it within your organization. In, in terms of uh, questions that people have, there, there will be another session uh, uh, next week for um, office hours for, for Q&A. So I hope to see some of you uh, there as well. Uh, as I see that there uh, have been a fair number of questions uh, in there. Um, in terms of accepting cryptocurrency, this was mentioned earlier uh, for uh, a couple of options. You can accept via a third party, uh, which is going to be the vast majority of organizations in terms of keeping it simple. Uh, or you can accept directly in sell, which involves setting up uh, something a little bit more involved where having your own private wallet and then having internal mechanisms for transferring it over to an exchange, selling it manually, and then reconciling uh, all of that. Generally speaking, accepting uh, via a third party is probably the, the most uh, effective and efficient for the vast majority of organizations. It's worth also keeping in mind your existing gift acceptance policy and examining that to, uh, to make sure that it does yeah. fit within your existing gift acceptance policy or if you need to make any changes uh, in that regard. And in terms of making it easy to, for donors to find your organization, having making sure you're putting on your website, having a page so it can be search engine optimized, integration and marketing, promoting it, and also crypto media. So uh, one thing to keep in mind is if they Google you and we're looking to donate crypto to your organization, will they be able to find you because you don't get donations you can't accept. So in terms of crypto media, is that here are some examples of crypto media that if you're looking to stay on top of developments in the, the crypto space, here's a few resources for those who may be interested in reading more. And in terms of anticipating the future, um, the questions that I like to pose to myself when thinking about the future, and, and I encourage you to think about this, is are, are things going to get faster or slower for the internet? Are they going to get harder or easier? Generally, I think they should get easier. Will people get more mobile, less mobile? Probably leaning towards mobile, mobile with progressive devices. Do people want more or less convenience? Probably more. And so, when we think about the question, will we see more or less a decentralized web? Is that from a trend line perspective, is that we'll likely see more. There's developments going on in the background. You're all here or we're chatting about it. And so part of that is for everyone who's here today, it's anticipating the future is also necessitates creating the future. And for many of you that are here today to learn a bit more and to also, if you do proceed with programs within your organizations, you'll be helping in, in creating that decentralized future as well. So at this point, I will stop here for questions and I'll stop sharing. So please feel free uh, to keep in touch and uh, I'll take a look at uh, some of the remaining uh, questions in the Q&A now as well. Sure. So uh, we only have a couple of minutes left. So I do want to get to uh, Richard's questions. He had a few of them, but one of the things he mentioned uh, was asking about are crypto investors more likely to support bigger causes? And do you think there's a lag in the thinking from UK compared to West Coast US? I, I think that it's not particularly necessary to crypto users, but I think donors will support the causes that they feel closest to. So that I think the bigger question there is around things like stewardship, around you know, how are you engaging with donors? How, what's your strategy for uh, for researching potential prospects and for engaging and getting them interested in, in donating to organizations? I, I, I think the question around uh, donors lean towards bigger organizations. I don't think that's necessarily always the case, uh, but sometimes as it goes, they if someone is searching for organizations to donate to, and that's the first thing that pops up and that's how they engage with that organization, that may very well be the, the, the situation there. It, it'll depend on existing kind of donor outreach efforts. 
Great. I think that's all the time we have for questions for today. So I'll throw it back to Billy. But if you have more questions or we didn't get to yours, definitely join us next week on Tuesday for open Q&A with Jason. Uh, Billy, go for it. Thanks. Thanks, Anne. And thank you so much, Jason, for that. I'm having a little mouse, mouse problem. It just doesn't want to click. Sorry. <laughs> so big for those of you who got something out of today's session, please send your reactions and love bombs to Jason. Jason, thank you so much for dropping your wisdom and experience on us. So helpful and insightful and clear. We're excited about you joining us again next week. Next Tuesday, we'll be hosting you again at the same time, same channel. I dropped a link to that office hours in our chat. Thank you, Anne, for facilitating Q&A. Next week, Tuesday, November 7th, Jason will join us again to go deeper with your questions. Please bring your questions, take notes over the next week, and Jason will be happy to dive in deeply with you. For those of you who had a great experience, please share your feedback on our post-event survey, which will drop in your inbox with our slides and recordings from this session. And we'll see you next Tuesday. Thank you, everybody. Thank you again, Jason. Have a great week. Thanks, everyone.